You're kicking the can down the road to a nuclear bomb, period, full stop. This is a massive threat to American national interest. So it really should matter to all Americans. And, and to your point, I cannot foresee a scenario where this isn't going to end in disaster one way or the other. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor-in-chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. And you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. The convening of a summit with Arab states on Israeli soil is something for anyone who cares about the Jewish state to savor. After being isolated from its neighbors for most of its 74 years of existence and being subjected to cruel boycotts and campaigns, both military and diplomatic, aimed at eliminating it, Israel has, in many respects, assumed its proper place as a nation to be reckoned with in the Middle East and the world. That's especially true in a time of crisis with the impact of a European war being felt in the region, as well as the impending agreement between the United States and Iran on a new and likely even more disastrous nuclear deal. But while this is a moment for Israelis to celebrate, marred though it has been by two deadly terrorist attacks inside the country in the last week, they would do well to concentrate more on the problems that the Jewish state and its Arab partners are facing than on endlessly hyping the historic nature of the summit. Indeed, the reason for convening such a meeting of Middle Eastern countries is not to have a party. It's the urgent need to coordinate their responses to the continued American retreat from the region, as well as the Biden administration's determination to push ahead the new nuclear deal with Iran that will make all of them a lot less safe. The meeting in the Negev Desert is with the ministers of three of the Arab countries who signed the Abraham Accords, normalizing relations in 2020 with a representative of Egypt, which signed a peace treaty with Israel in 1979, but whose relations with it were ice cold until the last few years when its government began to view Israel as an ally against the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamists. Joining the event, along with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, it's fair to say that the vision of expanding the circle of peace is being truly being realized. That's good reason for those involved in forging the normalization agreements, which was the work of both the Trump administration and the government of former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, to take satisfaction in seeing their achievement being followed up in this manner, rather than, as some of their critics claimed at the time, being a largely symbolic gesture that would not lead to tangible progress that would bring the nations in questions and others in the neighborhood closer together. That's bad news for the Palestinian Arabs who are lamenting the way they've been sidelined by the Accords. Those who hate Israel, including those American progressives who buy into intersectional myths about the Jewish state being a function of white privilege and continue to seek elimination, are out of touch with the diplomatic reality that the summit represents. But the Arab and Islamic world, not counting Iran and its Islamist allies, is no longer willing to be held hostage by Palestinian fantasies of rolling back the clock to 1947 or 1917. More to the point, they understand that Israel is not only a potential economic partner, but a vital strategic ally in the struggle against a country that is a genuine threat to them all, Iran. The Islamist regime is steeped in both Shia extremism, which frightens predominantly Sunni nations, as well as a desire to establish regional hegemony with the help of its various terrorist auxiliaries and allies. The process by which the Gulf states and others gave up their ideological and religion-based intolerance for Zionism didn't begin in 2020. But the rumblings in the Arab world about the need for an alternative to their being dragged into endless conflicts by the Palestinian refusal to make peace on any terms but Israel's destruction was given a major boost by President Barack Obama's first efforts to appease Iran. Their understanding that Obama was interested in abandoning them, as well as Israel, for a new connection with Tehran, pushed them into Israel's arms. 
And when the Trump administration got behind this trend, which former Secretary of State John Kerry declared to be as impossible as it was unwelcome because of his obsession with empowering the Palestinians, it became a reality. But the circumstances that made this current summit a necessity are ominous. Well, Blinken has been trying to calm both Israel and the Arab states by claiming the new Iran deal doesn't mean the Biden administration isn't committed to stopping Iran's nuclear ambition or its terrorism. His assurances are as worthless as they are disingenuous. The pact, whose final touches are still being worked on in Vienna, will be even more of a game changer than the original 2015 Joint and Comprehensive Plan of Action. With only a few years to go before the sunset clauses that will grant Iran a legal path to a bomb expire, the decision to once again kick the nuclear can down the road is even more irresponsible today than seven years ago. The massive infusion of cash that the lifting of sanctions and the sweeteners Biden's Iran envoy Robert Malley has tossed Tehran to entice them to rejoin the JCPOA will be a gift to the terrorists that depend on Iranian largesse. Yet even more serious is the message the U.S. is sending by agreeing to a deal that will inevitably lead to the West's acceptance that Iran is become a nuclear threshold state and that it won't take action to stop that from happening. That creates a new geostrategic reality for both Israel and the Arabs that they are on their own vis-a-vis -vis Iran that no amount of sweet talk from Blinken can erase. The combined strength of the summiteers and those who are not there but still aligned with them, like Saudi Arabia, makes them a formidable force. But that position is not nearly as strong as it would be if they, and the Iranians, knew that the United States had their back. And there is no mistaking that the American commitment to appeasing Iran, which seems to be an even higher priority than their current desire to aid Ukraine against Russia, is something that must inevitably overshadow the hoopla about what is happening in Israel right now. The point of the event is to demonstrate to the Iranians, as well as the Americans, that both Israel and the Arabs aren't taking these developments lying down. Their closeness, which the summit is illustrating, is a repose to the new JCPOA that ought to give both Biden and Iran pause. But it would be foolish to pretend that the circumstances that brought them together is not a catastrophic American policy for which no regional alliance can entirely compensate. A world in which the United States is content to continue retreating, as demonstrated by Biden's disgraceful exit from Afghanistan, is one in which a great many terrible things suddenly become realistic possibility. That's part of the correlation of forces that led to the invasion of Ukraine. Forestalling similar nightmare scenarios is the top priority of Israel and its new partners. But the notion that any such alliance can entirely replace the part played by an America that is no longer committed to defending its friends and deterring its foes is wishful thinking. And now to our interview of the week. Are Americans ready to live with the consequences of their country retreating from the world stage? While concern for the suffering of those who have been imperiled by Russia's invasion of Ukraine is real, there seems little awareness of the connection between that disaster and the American weakness that invited it. Just as important, there seems to be confusion about what the goals of American foreign policy currently are something that is the result of the widely varying messages that President Biden has issued during the course of the crisis, and which was demonstrated again by his statement endorsing regime change in Moscow that was quickly and predictably walked back by the White House, as it has so many of the things that have come out of his mouth in the last 15 months. That's all the more important, because the one thing we know the administration really wants to do is to appease Iran with a new nuclear deal, that won't stop it from getting a nuclear weapon, but which has put American allies in the Middle East, including both Israel and the Arab states, in a position where they must hope their new alliance will somehow make up for Biden's inability and unwillingness to face up to that challenge. With us to discuss these issues and a lot more is one of the sharper new voices of American conservatism, 
Benjamin Weingarten is deputy editor of Real Clear Investigations, a senior contributor to The Federalist, columnist at Newsweek, and the Epoch Times, co-host of the Edmund Burke Foundation's NatCon Squad podcast, and a fellow of the Claremont Institute. He's a 2019 recipient of a Robert Novak Journalism Fellowship, under the auspices of which he is working on a book on U.S.-China policy. His first book was American Ingrate, Ilhan Omar and the Progressive Islamist Takeover of the Democratic Party. A frequent contributor to a variety of publications, he is also the founder and CEO of Change Up Media, a conservative media consulting and production company. Ben Weingarten, welcome to Top Story. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure, Jonathan. Oh, it's great having you on. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, ben, I want to start with the latest foreign policy debacle um, that we have to deal with, President Biden's call for Russian regime change that was quickly walked back by the White House. Uh, whatever conclusions we want to draw about uh, Biden's confusion, the problem, I think, is that there is real confusion about what the goals of American foreign policy are, even on issues like Ukraine, where there is pretty much across the broad uh, board the support for opposing Putin's war. What do you make of this? And where do you see U.S. policy on Russia and Ukraine heading in a war that seems nowhere close to ending? Yeah, well, let me say narrowly on the issue of calling for regime change. And it's been reported that this was off script, a concluding remark. It's very disturbing how many times the president says things sort of as an aside which have major implications, potentially nuclear war-like implications. Mm -hmm. And it's constantly being walked back by his staff. There was a time where, at least in certain situations, like Taiwan, China, for example, we've had a policy for a long time, at least pre-Biden, of strategic ambiguity. I don't know what this is, because this does not seem at all intentional. And when we don't have clarity in terms of the rhetoric of our leaders, first of all, it calls into question whether there's clarity in terms of the actual policy itself. Mm -hmm. I think it's clear this is not intentionally putting out certain lines as trial balloons to see how the world will react, obviously given the massive ramifications of this. But there clearly are calls for regime change. The president said Vladimir Putin's a war criminal. This sort of rhetoric combined with some of the actions being undertaken would imply that perhaps there is a view that Putin must go. And of course, there are people in this administration who also populated the Obama-Biden administration who have taken that sort of position, for example, with respect to Gaddafi, with Libya, and in other instances as well. So I'm very, I'm very concerned about that sort of errant remark, at least as his handlers put it, and it also calls into question who actually is calling the shots with respect to policy, a another disturbing aspect of it. You know, more broadly, I think your question is sort of the question that every American should be asking, which is what is in the American national interest with respect to a resolution to the Russia-Ukraine situation? And I think Biden's instincts over many decades has been not to intervene. You know, clearly we saw this mm -hmm. with respect to Afghanistan. A pullout, by the way, which I agreed with the fact that it wasn't clear that there was a vital national interest being served by continuing to have an American presence like we had in Afghanistan. But obviously, the pullout itself was disastrous, and I've, I've written about this at length. What is our national interest here? You know, you see Zelensky, for example, now, and it seems like he's coming around to the position of neutrality. Ukraine is a truly neutral mm -hmm. country. He's, he's voicing, at least, that he's not going to give on the demilitarization, as Vladimir Putin has called for. If you look at the long history of American foreign policy and you look back to the founding statesmen of this country, they believe that America, in most cases, ought to be a neutral country and that we should go abroad you know, not seeking monsters to destroy. Right. There are plenty of monsters in the world. Uh, to the extent that Ukraine is not going to be a proxy of the U.S., and it doesn't seem like that is ultimately going to be the outcome, then I think the best we can hope for is something of a buffer state that won't choose either side, probably will not be a member of NATO, and perhaps ultimately that is going to be the best of a series of bad options here. But I don't really see the administration itself pushing in a muscular way for a policy of de-escalation and ultimately a detente over Russia-Ukraine. And that's 
that's a little bit disconcerting to me. Also disconcerting is the fact that while the administration has been at pains, although there's been some ambiguity here, like with respect to the MIGs with Poland, for example, mm -hmm. in terms of not getting the U.S. involved at an increased level militarily with a no-fly zone and the like, which obviously could create a shooting war ultimately. Um, I, I do think we have to ask, you know, why is it that the American people are essentially being punished economically here? And as this drags on, it's going to continue. Russia, like Iran, like a China, for example, if it ended up in this situation, will be able to weather economic pain to a much greater extent than the U.S. What happens if we go months into this and we continue to see skyrocketing American prices for all manner of basic goods, the president talking about food shortages, and there isn't a resolution? It's going to feel as if we're facing a lot of the pain here, not Vladimir Putin and his kleptocratic regime. And so I think these are all considerations that we have to think about in context of this question. And, and, I, and the fact that the administration has not voiced clearly, here's the outcome that we seek, here are all the steps we're going to take to achieve it, and here's how we're going to defend our liberty, our freedom, our strength in the process, it's disconcerting that that hasn't been voiced. Yeah, I think there's so much truth in what you just said, because there's so much to unpack here. You know, there's so much that amid all the emotion, we're just not discussing. I mean, clearly sympathy for Ukraine is both justified and real, but it's like, how do you account for the fact that this conflict, unlike any other in recent decades, seems to have caught the imagination of the American public, or at least that of the chattering classes and pop culture arbiters of the national conversation? And I, I guess one thing that I keep wondering about is, would a Putin invasion of Ukraine have generated this much outrage, if not for the years of mainstream media promotion of the Russia collusion hoax about Trump and a similarly false narrative about Ukraine being a victim of the last administration? Yeah, let me say two things on that. The first is we have a real world test of this during the Obama years when you had the incursion mm -hmm. into Crimea. You did not have people changing their profile pictures to <laughs> the yellow Facebook and blue for... flag at that time or you know, award shows and people are virtue signaling regarding a place they probably couldn't locate on a map. They couldn't tell you about what vice, then Vice President Biden's posture was with respect to Ukraine during the last administration. They can't tell you about the whole litany of history with regard to what was in America's interest with, with respect to Ukraine, what our position was vis-a-vis -vis Russia, et cetera. And, and that disingenuousness, I think, is disturbing because it speaks to that emotional kind of reaction as opposed to a rational one. An emotional reaction, which, by the way, doesn't even take into account the fact that many of these people in the chattering class that you mention are devout adherents of the environmental religion and the environmental religion which has put us in a position where we are at all dependent on Russian oil, obviously to the detriment of America's national interest and hurting us right now. Set all that aside, I think your point is very well taken that making Vladimir Putin and Russia the boogeyman is really kind of a remarkable transformation. And I tweeted about this actually just yesterday. When you look at the left and even the liberal left, during the Cold War. Obviously, there were romances to some extent with many of the Soviet leaders. There were, of course, dupes, useful idiots, and worse on the American side during the Cold War, and they were to be found in the Democrat Party, obviously not in the Republican Party. It's remarkable to see people who at one time were at, at least apologists, a percentage of them, and appeasers, I would argue, for a Soviet regime a clearly imperialist Soviet regime that sought to be the dominant world power to dominate every country versus the posture that they have now. And they've done a complete 180. And now they are as virulently anti-Putin, anti-Russian regime uh, as we've seen them be anti any really rogue adversarial power in the world. That's a remarkable transformation. And so you have to ask, is this rooted in the merits and, and principles of the situation when you know, of course, the left has no problem doing business with all manner of evil regimes. You know, they'll speak to human rights issues and the like. But uh, look, obviously, the Ukrainian ruling regime itself, of course, has been corrupted over decades. Um, obviously, we're all on the side of the Ukrainian regime vis-a-vis -vis the Putin regime. But, you know, they don't talk about human rights issues and lack of freedoms there. 
Um, so I, it, it reads as cynical, political, disingenuous, virtue signaling, even if we agree on the merits that obviously we'd like to see the Russian military bleed and we'd love to see mm -hmm. Putin deterred here. So to the question of the, the Russia gate, Hillary Clinton, I guess, in large respect, can can take credit for making Russia uh, the world's greatest adversary versus America. But the real winner of this, we should say, is communist China, period, full stop. The senior partner in this relationship with Russia to Russia's junior partner. And I actually, and I've argued this for a long time, Russiagate was one of the greatest things that could happen to communist China. You know, communist China has taken advantage of two things, really, over the last 20 years. First, the U.S. being mired in quagmires in the Middle East, which China, of course, gleaned intel on and also bid its time, built itself up as America exhausted itself in blood, treasure, and morale there. And then also the Russiagate diverting American energies from the greatest adversary we face. And then also, of course, pushing Russia and China closer together. And if you look at what President Trump's advisors were saying in the earliest days of his administration, even if you go back to the transition, one of the things that the Trump administration wanted to do was try to build some kind of relationship with Russia in areas where our interests, theoretically at least, overlapped, in no small part, I think, to effectuate a reverse modern-day Sino-Soviet split, to split mm -hmm. Russia from China. Instead, of course, under cloud of Russiagate, the exact opposite has happened, and now we have Russia and China as closer partners than they've ever been since the throes of the Cold War. And we can debate, of course, whether or not Russia would have ever worked with us or would have cynically tried to exploit and manipulate a relationship mm -hmm. like that. But I think the fact of the matter is making Russia the chief enemy serves to the benefit of our real greatest adversary of all, China. And of course, China, Russia, and Iran, as I think you spoke to my friend Josh Hammer about in a prior mm -hmm. episode, form a new sort of axis of evil with their proxies exactly. and partners, including in our own hemisphere. Yeah, I mean, there there's so many ironies and so many, you know, uh, that go into this. And uh, I'll just go back to m one of my favorite observations that nobody seems to to pick up on is that, you know, some of the same people that are, you know, whose hair is on fire about what is going on between Russia and Ukraine. And, you know, it, as we both have said repeatedly, it's an outrage. We're against it. We're against Putin. We want him to lose. And yet the, some of these same people were fine with appeasing and being against confronting a Soviet Union that was occupying Ukraine and oppressing Ukrainians and, you know, trying to stamp out Ukrainian nationalism. So it's just, it's kind of nuts. You're absolutely right about Russia, but, uh, excuse me, about China. But let's, before we get to that, I want to discuss what seems to be Biden's uh, one real prior policy priority, which isn't so much about getting tough with Russia, but a rapprochement with Iran. While it still hasn't been finally concluded, the reporting out of Vienna um, with the talks in the in nuclear deal it shows that it will be even more disastrous than Obama's. Yet there seems to be little awareness or debate in Washington about the consequences of this policy and, you know, what anybody's, how anybody is going to respond to it. Yeah, and, and so let's note also, by the way, the irony here that, of course, has been noted by many, Russia is viewed as the chief conduit, the chief facilitator of mm -hmm. this Iran deal 2.0. And of course, remember, the Obama-Biden administration outsourced Syrian policy to Russia to a large extent. So again, who are they an adversary or are they the chief facilitator of the highest aspirations of the Obama-Biden administration and now, and now the Biden administration. Yeah, I mean, and going on right now because they're they're basically granting Russia, you know, an exemption from the sanctions that, you know, everybody's, you know, very eager to impose upon them with respect to Iran. I mean, it's it, you couldn't make it up, um, you know, if, if it were fiction, but it's actually happening. And with respect to what this deal, the, the substance of this deal, I think it's very telling that as with the prior iteration, the so-called JCPOA, there's no indication this is going to be submitted to the Senate for ratification as a treaty. And that, I think, tells you pretty much all you need to know about this agreement, sort of like you know, the Paris Climate Accord. The fact that this will not be submitted to the representatives of the American people to give an up-down vote on and to see if they overwhelmingly agree with it at a two-thirds vote, I think speaks volumes about this policy because the Biden administration knows this would not be popular with the American public, just like the original Iran deal 
was not popular with the American public. I guess the silver lining, of course, is that then a, a next president in 2024, like Trump before him, could go about extricating America from such a deal. But so much damage could be done in the interim. And, and you know, the fact that, of course, Israel you know, has been indicating and, of course, striking at Iran tied assets in the region in recent years, of course, engaged in all manner of sabotage over the years with respect to Iran's nuclear programs, taking out their scientists, uh, allegedly at least, and, and, and the like. It speaks to the fact that ultimately it's probably going to come down to Israel and perhaps its Sunni Arab partners. And you know, we'll note that there was recently a very high level meeting between yeah. Iran and, and the Burj, uh, between Israel rather and this burgeoning partnership. Yeah. Which is going uh, on actually right as we're recording this. Uh. Right now, I think that also speaks volumes. Um, you know, there's symbolism, but then there is the substantive significance of the fact that I think Israel will have to take its own defense into its own hands. And there is a real question here. And, and let's note that, of course, the Obama administration several times leaked out information to sort of preempt an Israeli strike or potential strike on mm -hmm. Iranian nuclear assets last time around. I, I, am, I, I think it, we could end up in a very disturbing situation in terms of what the Biden administration would do to the extent Israel felt it needed to act because of an existential threat that will follow, again, the refilling of the coffers of the world's leading state sponsor of terror by the State Department's own measure, as well as the potential nuclearization of Iran and Iran deal 1.0, of course, essentially and not even essentially in, in practice would have provided an American defense for Iranian nuclear assets. So is that going to happen now this time around? And, and by all accounts, the substance of this deal will likely be worse. And where is oh, where's the oversight of this? Why haven't we heard a peep from Robert Malley, who essentially it, it appears is the one negotiating this, who's obviously been a disaster in all manner of dealings with Islamic supremacists, Sunni and Shia in the past. Where's the oversight of these negotiations that are going on? It's incredibly disturbing. And what does it tell you that, to your point, this seems to be the one crown jewel from the Biden administration's perspective of its foreign policy, just like, again, during the Obama-Biden years, making Iran the strong horse in the region out of some perverse sense of justice and what I would call the equity agenda applied internationally. What does that tell you that they believe that making the the malocracy the dominant power in the Middle East is their overarching goal for the region? Disastrous, obviously, for American national interests, as opposed to lining up these Sunni Arab powers and Israel together in a remarkable partnership that I would have never predicted could have existed, but because they face what they perceive to be a shared existential threat from Iran. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very important point. Um, the summit going on in Israel uh, with the Arab states certainly should be celebrated as an indication of the success of the Abraham Accords, but it is a fruit of, of basically the Arabs being pushed into Israel's arms by uh, Obama's policies of appeasing um, uh, Iran and now uh, carried on by Biden. Um, but I think the thing that worries me, I think that should worry people in Israel and elsewhere, is that as strong as this new alliance between Israel and its Arab uh, allies is, it's not really as strong as it would be or could be if America were not retreating from the region and choosing, as you say, um, to make Iran the strong horse. Um, they're being left on their own to deal with this by Biden. And, um, you, know, the, you know, we don't know how this is gonna play out because once the deal is in place, it's basically impossible to imagine the United States going along with actions by Israel or Saudi Arabia or any of the other Arab states to to stop Iran from you know, from you know from making further progress, because you know as you say you know yes, a successor administration to Biden could address this in 2025, but that's really almost too late. Um, you know the 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 Iran the the thing that made. Obama's deal so terrible was that not just because it was weak, not just because, you know, there was very little oversight, um, but because it expired, you know, by the end of this decade and basically gave Iran a legal path to a bomb. And, you know, where, you know, in 2015, it was possible to just say, okay, we can kick the can down the road. Somebody else will deal with this in 10 years. Well, 
we're almost there, as they say. You know, if you don't have a plan, you're already there. We're kind of already there. And um, there's, no, it, you know, it's a given that there will be no outpouring of sympathy or support if Israel or its Arab neighbors are attacked um, by Iranian auxiliaries. And, you know, it's kind of the way, you know, Ukraine is dealing with. Um, so, you know, we don't know how this is going to play out, do we? I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you made that point. I cannot imagine people changing their profile pictures to the Israeli flag and all manner of people virtue signaling over Israel. Of course, you know, we'll, they'll say it's a complicated, nuanced issue and, and, and there are two sides, et cetera, which, of course, points to the utter and rank hypocrisy here, the disingenuous nature of it. Yeah, you're kicking the can down the road to a nuclear bomb, period, full stop. Obviously, those nuclear materials, of course, we don't know what the delivery mechanism would be. And, and to the extent they proliferate, we don't know whose hands ultimately those weapons might end up in. But of course, when you're talking about a country like Israel, you're talking about a New Jersey-sized nation. It, it doesn't take much for there to be a cataclysmic disaster, which of course will also be disastrous to U.S. national interest. It, it, there's a reason that Israel is our number one strategic partner in the region, as well as obviously for historical reasons in terms of our values, principles, shared governmental structure, et cetera. But if you're looking at this from the perspective of hard-headed realism, a strong Israel in that region is hugely significant to American national interest. And this is, a, this is a massive threat to American national interest. So it really should matter to all Americans. And, and to your point, I cannot foresee a scenario where this isn't gonna end in disaster one way or the other. Uh, Israel, if it's forced to strike, of course, is going to incur massive damages itself likely as well because of the terrorist army that Iran has built up there and abroad. Uh, so I, I think it's a horrible scenario and Israel may be forced to preempt it. And what will, what will transpire then? How will the Biden administration respond, I think, puts us in a very dark and perilous place potentially in American history. Yeah, I, I just want to, before we move on from Iran, I want to sort of get your opinion about another angle on this, which is about the opposition to Biden here in the United States, the GOP, and their ability to form an alternative policy. When, as in 2015, they seem, you know, when we're talking about the Republican leadership in Congress, pretty much prepared to give up on the Iran issue, rather than make Biden pay any kind of price for enacting a disastrous policy. And as, as you already noted, as Obama and John Kerry did, flouting the constitutional requirements for a treaty to be ratified by two-thirds vote of the Senate. Personally, I believe, um, you know, that, that spoke, you know, that decision in 2015 for the Republican leadership, you know, specifically, you know, Senate Majority Leader McConnell and then uh, Foreign, you know, Foreign Relations Committee uh, Chair um, Bob Corker, to go along with this sort of sham um, law that allows oversight of the Iran policy, but which instead of requiring a treaty to get a two-thirds vote, uh, allowed Obama to get by with one-third plus one vote in either in either house of of, of uh, Congress. Um, once again, they're rolling over for this. They're not, you know, saying, "Okay, we're going to defund the State Department." We're not going to approve a symbol diplomatic appointment until you submit this as a treaty. Um, they're playing along with it the way the Republican establishment always seems to do when, you know, it's something that, you know, sort of doesn't threaten their hold on power, um, but which is something that, you know, elements of the base care about. It's very well said. And it is important to recall that history where they basically inverted the treaty power. Mm -hmm. R remarkably so. So... They did damage to American law and really the legitimacy of the Senate, an institution that the establishment claims to care most about protecting you know, the institutional merits of the imprimatur of the U.S. Senate. And then they did absolute damage to it and U.S. law and America's national interest last time around. And to some extent, I think it speaks to a broader problem that we're seeing in the Senate, which is that essentially there's been a and this is open and overt, a conscious decision to running into 2022, run a content free campaign and essentially let one's enemies hang themselves. But I think the first thing you have to say is, would the Democrats ever run a campaign 
like that? Would they ever run a campaign <laughs> where they say, oh, the Republicans, they're hanging themselves, so let's just step back? No, of course. Every single day, every single second of every single day, they would be extracting their more than a pound of flesh. And this speaks to a problem of both ideology and tactics. And one thing I've always said, one rule that I think, and this is just from a purely political, pragmatic perspective that Republicans have to operate on, is you always ask yourself the question, what would Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer do in an equivalent situation? Mm -hmm. And if you're not acting accordingly, how can you expect over the long run to triumph on these issues to the extent your ultimate objective is to triumph? on these issues. If the other side is going to pursue things with full gusto, you have to be able to counteract that. You have to act just as toughly, just as shrewdly, or you're gonna lose a lot of the time. And there's no honor in losing with dignity when we're talking about these losses because we're not in a paradigm, a political paradigm anymore, where it's sort of, we all agree generally on what we believe about the greatness of this country and we all wanna make it better and we just differ at the margins about how we get there. No, we're not in that kind of situation anymore. It is, I've called it a cold civil war, but you see, at least in terms of our representatives, really only one side's fighting it and the other side is largely controlled opposition. Yeah, I think that's, you know, it, it goes to the heart of so many of our political, you know, controversies. Um, and, you know, speaking personally, I, you know, as I was, you know, when I look back on what I wrote in 2015, I was all over the Republicans for not doing more, for, for going along with the sham, for being played by Obama and, you know, and his media, you know, his media echo chamber. But I, you know, the following year, um, when basically the Republican electorate rejected the Republican establishment and chose Trump, I mean, this was a foretaste. I mean, and I think a lot of us, even those who cared about the issues, were very slow to understand why it was happening. And in fact, you know, the the you know the base got it in a way that you know some of you know the Republican chattering classes did not. That if this is how you know our leaders are going to be, then we're going to we're going to you know we're going to choose a reality talk show host if he's willing to you know not play by the rules. Um, and that's where we are, you know, in, in, you know, in, in this country right now, aren't we? The chasm between purported representatives, I, I would have never used the term ruling class probably five years ago, but it just mm -hmm. so perfectly captures, I think, this sort of bifurcation of our society between you know, the pseudo intellectuals, the credentialed class, political leaders, uh, corporate CEOs and the like, there's just such a huge divergence culturally and then it manifests itself in terms of policies to be pursued and also what people perceive their self-interest to be. The, the chasm is so great and we see this at a more micro level in terms of Republican rank and file voters, love of Trump as you know, sort of a symbol of um, to excuse my French, an FU to mm -hmm. leadership, to the political establishment. And we see it more broadly, I think, in terms of the people who have disproportionate sway over public discourse, over public policy, over private enforcement of public policy. There's a great piece in Tablet recently on the invasion of the fact checkers, I, th I think is the title, mm -hmm. by Jacob Siegel. And he makes the case that the so-called fact checkers are essentially administrative state agents just in the private sector enforcing regime ideology via our media and then of course later in our social media uh, to censor essentially discourse promote narratives that are helpful to the regime as i'll call it capital r and so i think yeah, and, and i just want to interject here that this is not a strictly partisan dispute because this not at all uniparty of, of of the establishment you know is as we've just alluded to on on iran both republicans and democrats um you know it, it's it's about you know what you just call the ruling classes the the educated classes however you know however you want to put it um as opposed to uh, the rest of the country and you know having these as you say you know as that piece noted you know, these sort of uh, woke commissars enforcing, you know, ideological uniformity, which is now happening throughout uh, throughout our culture, um, including the arts, um, is, is just one more sign of it. 
And you kind of know how people who identify Republican or Democrat in this ruling class that we're speaking to are going to shake out on environmentalism, on crime, on policy, economic policy with respect to China. You could run, you can run down the list of items and you know how they're going to end up. And if you look at, you ask the question, qui bono, who benefits from this? They will ultimately benefit from it or at least be insulated from the consequences of those policies. But the tens of millions of Americans who actually have to grapple with the consequences of these issues are left behind. And so, and I think that it just comes down to, at the end of the day, it's a practical question of the ruling class serves itself and tens of millions of Americans feel they are not represented by them, feel they're not only underserved by their betters, but actually scorned uh, the mm -hmm. contempt I mean, obviously the deplorable irredeemable etc that really rung true for a lot of people when barack obama talked about clinging to their guns religion etc you know they just thumb their noses at tens of millions of americans and those tens of millions of americans have suffered under many of these policies and we can debate the extent of it but the fact of the matter is why would people keep supporting purported leaders who push policies that ultimately hurt them and until and unless those leaders ultimately come around, recalibrate to where the public is, there's going to be, continue to be substantial acrimony. And I think this chasm is only going to grow wider. And I can only hope that the ruling class fails in its bid to achieve essentially hegemony over our country, because I think it'll be a disaster for tens of millions of people. And, and the question that's really never posed at the end of the day is, if you pursue your policies to the end game, that end game, in my view, and I think they themselves would even admit this, will be with China as a dominant world power. What do you think happens to you, your wealth, your family members with China as a world power, XYZ ruling class member? And that question is never put to them, nor is it answered. I think they feel they can feed the crocodile and it won't eat them at the end of the day, or they feel that because they have accommodated and worked so closely with communist China, that to the extent China dominates the world, they will be protected. But that's very foolish. Anyone who's ever studied any kind of regime like this regime, whether or not you think it's doctrinally consistent with Maoism, Marxism, Leninism, and if you look at their rhetoric and their policies, they claim to be devoted to it, even set aside that academic argument. The first people lined up and shot will be the people who try to accommodate them. Yeah, uh, that's very true, although they believe they're profiting from it. Well, uh, you know, this is the threat to American interests that few seem to be sufficiently alarmed about. Um, China certainly poses, as you say, a far more potent challenge to American interest than anything going on in Eastern Europe, as much as, you know, the war in Ukraine is terrible. In your work on this subject, do you see any path, any realistic path, I should say, to a new U.S. policy that can or will disentangle the American economy from that of China, something that is, I think, necessary for any real effort to uh, make China think it will be punished the way Russia is currently uh, being punished uh, over, over Ukraine, if they were to attack Taiwan or do anything else that you know, threatens U.S. interests. Yeah, and I've thought about that parallel also. The day after an invasion of Taiwan, would everyone be changing profile pictures to the Taiwanese flag? Again, would you have every single major company pulling their operations out of mainland China the next day and completely extricating them, themselves from China? I think it, at very best, we'd say maybe not. I think almost certainly you would not have U.S. purported U.S. companies pulling themselves out to the extent they even see themselves. Well, that part way. of that is because our, you know, our economic involvement in China over the course of the last 20 years dwarfs that of any investment in Russia or any connection with Russia, right? Russia provides not cost-free virtue signaling, but pretty close to cost-free virtue signaling to pull your operations out of there, to, mm -hmm. to cut, to cancel Russia from the global economy on a relative basis for a lot of these companies. Yeah, we have made our bed in terms of communist China, which was the brilliance of their strategy, which is unlike the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was essentially closed off from the West. China said, we're going to welcome the West in. We are going to let you underwrite, capitalize us. We'll steal some of your technology and intellectual property mm -hmm. along the way, but you won't fight it because you see how big a market that we have. And they always hold that carrot out over American businesses, but it has totally corrupted American industry. It has totally corrupted in, in large part think tanks, 
obviously Hollywood, so you have the cultural influence and dominance really over Hollywood as well as the money associated with it. And you look at every sector of society, it's hard to find a sector of society that hasn't been compromised. Obviously higher education and even lower education as well. And so to your broad question of, could you see there being an, a, a pro-American strategy in the face of a, a communist China that wants to be the dominant power? I absolutely could. Now, it requires both will and capability. I think we have the capability. We could draw up all manner of laws that could be put into effect that would help effectuate this shift. Tomorrow, if you had federal authorities saying, we are going to impose sanctions on any U.S. bank that has certain kinds of dealings with either Communist Party officials or Chinese Communist Party tied entities, which is any business that has dealings in mainland China and probably beyond, as well. And you actually saw a major U.S. bank sanctioned. I think the next day you would have a massive, massive shift in society. Now, could we imagine XYZ massive U.S. bank being sanctioned by our authorities over their dealings with communist China with ample notice? I don't know that I could have foreseen such a scenario today. Do I think the American people would be on board with an agenda like that? I do think a large percentage of Americans would, in particular because if you looked at polling as the Chinese coronavirus pandemic was unfolding, Americans mm. in large measure, huge percentages, highest percentages we've seen since the polling has been done, I think by Pew, for example, took a very hostile tone towards communist China, viewed it as an adversary, viewed it as an enemy. I think a majority of Americans did. So I think there's a will among the American public to take on China. Obviously, there would be substantial pain because our supply chains still in large part run through it. But if you just pose the simple question to the American people, can we ever be reliant on communist China for basic everyday medicines that we use, like transpired during that pandemic? And China, of course, threatened to plunge, I think in the words of their mouthpiece publication, plunge Americans into the sea of the coronavirus by withholding those basic medicines or all manner of other basic goods that we need, not to mention some of the natural resources that China has sought to monopolize in recent decades. I think the American people get it. Does our ruling class get it? Well, unfortunately, they're bought and paid for in large measure. That is the ultimate challenge that we face. I don't think it's a matter of capability. I think it's a matter of will among the people who actually make policy, among those in the private sector who have been open to communist China, who claim to care about human rights and the like, and are dealing with a genocidal power, massive power, nuclear armed, with ambitions globally, building a Belt and Road Initiative to sort of colonialize and use a loan to own strategy to build up strategic interests around the globe without actually really colonizing and dealing with the downsides that they've seen when other powers try to go into uh, other neighborhoods of the world very shrewdly. We are capable of doing so. Do we have the will? I think that is the ultimate question. Do we have the will to extricate ourselves when Chinese money and Chinese influence is everywhere in U.S. society? You know, I asked a question to someone who worked uh, in the Trump administration, if you wanted to do an audit of the federal government and look for what public dollars are being used in programming with or what ventures are being undertaken in programs with Chinese entities or Chinese linked entities. Obviously, we see the worst example of this with Wuhan Institute of Virology. <laughs> how, how would you do this audit? And the question that I got in response was, well, how do you define a Chinese linked entity? Is Disney a Chinese linked entity? And you could run down the list. You could run down all firms in the, in the private sector mm -hmm. and then public as well. That speaks to the level of compromise that we face and the challenges that we face. And I've written at length about Senator Dianne Feinstein from California because I think she personifies this in her, her own life. Of course, people know she had a Chinese spy driver and more working in her office for a couple of decades. And then if you look at the relations that have been cultivated between Dianne Feinstein at the highest levels of foreign policy as a former Senate Foreign Relations Committee chair and as a senior member of the Senate Intel Committee for many years as well. And she has been all for the integration over decades with communist China and cultivating of relationships, obviously so-called free trade with China, which is anything but free. That is the personification of the relationship, but she is just one of many at the top of American society, and that's obviously disastrous for us.
Yeah, I think that's that's so true. And, you know, I just want to reemphasize the point that this is not just a, a you know, Democrats versus Republicans issue. Um, I can recall just going back in my own memories in the late 90s when I was actually doing, you know, in another life, doing a lot of writing about the issue of human rights in China and trying to raise some awareness of it at a time when we weren't so integrated into the China, you know, with the Chinese uh, in our economy and speaking with some conservative scholars at, uh, you know, at Heritage in Washington. And they were like looking at me as if I had two heads and saying like, well, if Americans want to make more money in China, why are we stopping them? And, you know, that's where we are now. Um, let me just, you know, just shift slightly by saying that there are a lot of people who say that uh, too much involvement in Ukraine and the focus on Russia is going to hamper our ability uh, as America, as a power, to stand up to China. But this isn't really an either-or question, is it? Isn't the problem, in fact, finding a way to cope with, um, as I've written, a Russia-China-Iran alliance that is, despite their difference, a three-pronged attack on American interests? Absolutely. And they, they each serve different elements. They're, Russia is integral to China in large part because Russia is natural resource rich and China is natural resource poor, although they have dominated certain rare earth metals, for example, being one place where China has dominated and, and they're trying to dominate in other areas as well in terms of hard assets, depriving us of those hard assets, by the way, which is of course, if you are not independent of a Russia or a China, you are dependent on Russia or China. Mm -hmm. And America cannot be dependent on its enemies, obviously. I, I totally take your point and agree. You can't look at any one of these situations in isolation. They all work together and they provide different things for the other parties. And you know, since you talk about Iran, and there are these strategic partnerships, technical, formal strategic partnerships in some respects, maybe slightly below strategic partnerships. When you look at China and Iran's relationship, Russia and Iran's relationship, mutually beneficial, obviously not good for America, they reinforce each other and they provide different things for each other. And also, as the U.S. picks sides, for example, in the Middle East, namely the Iranian side, of course, then you see Russia and China cultivating relationships, trying to create wedges between the U.S. and a Saudi Arabia or many of these other Sunni Arab pa powers. And of course, these are no angels. None of these Sunni mm -hmm. Arab partners are angels in any respect. But we're talking about a world of murderers and thugs. And, and we have to look out for our interest in a very dangerous world of people whose regimes we would not want to live under on any side. But of course, China and Russia being totally amoral and totally focused, it would seem, on their pursuing whatever they, the ruling regimes perceive their interest to be, of course, are going to exploit these relationships. And that further creates wedges which undermine America's ability to build up sort of these security conduits around the world so that we shoulder a smaller burden, we can pursue our freedom here at home, and we can leverage these bulwarks being built against these other powers abroad. So, and, and I think this is one of the ways in which the Trump policy was willfully and intentionally, I think, misrepresented. The, the Trump administration simply wanted our purported partners and friends to pay their fair share, essentially, in helping defend mm -hmm. our shared interests. And maybe pursued that in ways that were impolitic or undiplomatic, but maybe that's required sometimes in this world. Now we see the reverse, and in the reverse scenario, it's a free-for-all for Russia, for China. North Korea, of course, increasing its saber-rattling, and I see North Korea as a client of China. China, of course, tries to play itself as you know, the honest broker here between the West and North Korea, just like Russia plays itself as the honest broker between the U.S. and Iran. You see how they ruthlessly and calculatingly all pursue their interests in individually and then collectively. They are not perfect. These regimes are corrupted. I am sure there are cracks in terms of their own ruling classes. And, you know, Xi Jinping himself, could he ever be deposed? Could there be a coup against him? Yeah, it's possible. There's a reason that he has to engage in purges where he takes out mm -hmm. tens of thousands of potential opponents or threats to his powers. So these are inherently unstable regimes. You know their instability by the fact they need to censor and repress and put down anyone who dares question them. And that's what disturbs me the most, is that we live in a world of people who crush dissenters and repress their opposition. And increasingly, you see that rubbing off 
on our own rolling class. And, and that's why my two biggest focuses are really the China threat in league with these powers that you mentioned who all provide it different things. Of course, Iranian chaos against our interests hurts us, helps ultimately, at least indirectly, the Chinas and the Russias of the world. But when we start to act, at least directionally, more like them at home or a Justin Trudeau does the same to mm. our north, that's really disturbing to me. And that means, and ultimately these other powers will not defeat us if we have the will and capability, as I said, if we, if we reinstill in ourselves what our values and principles, what the American system actually is all about. But when we start to have an American uh, social credit, a social credit system with American characteristics, which I fear we're definitely going in that direction, that's disturbing to me. And it speaks to the fact that we'll, will ultimately implode in one way or another before we ever get around to grappling with the threats we face from abroad. Yeah, that that's very important. And it's also a good segue to what my next question, which is about how a, a lot of these problems and our, our, our inability to address them as a nation is due to the failure of the media, the collapse of its credibility, along with the, the actions of, you know, big tech giants. Right now, the same outlets that lied about the original Iran deal, Russia collusion, and then covered up the hard Hunter Biden story, something we've both written about, are lining up to shut down discussion on other issues. Do you think there is a fix for a democracy in which the legacy media isn't merely partisan, but actively seeking to suppress opponents, and with the owners of the information superhighways, uh, you know, assistance, um, really uh, successfully doing that. Yeah, I, I think the media has been self-discrediting and we now, I think, as a public, well, I'll speak for myself here, but I assume that this is the case more broadly. We exist in echo chambers and I consume what the left puts out, uh, even if I disagree with all of it, because you have to know what they're thinking mm -hmm. and how they're how they're plotting and planning and what their arguments are. And you know, can you can you counter these arguments on the merits and strengthens your own thinking and conviction? So it's useful and important to do. But it's hard to see legacy media, corporate media, however we want to characterize it as anything but essentially a perpetual information operation machine. I mean, you can glean nuggets of this is factual, like, for example, Hunter Biden laptop, paragraph 24 in the New York Times story. OK, they actually did disclose, cleanse a fact, <laughs> but it's centered. It, it, it's it's almost an afterthought in a piece, which, of course, doesn't highlight it in the title. And I think or I think in the subtitle mm -hmm. of it. Uh, and it's sort of, I imagine, what it would have been like reading Pravda or reading any one of these kind of rags in pick your third world Soviet satellite decades ago. You can glean little nuggets of truth or you can see the competing um, you know, sort of coteries who are trying to get their message out. But the media basically runs the narrative that is the narrative of our administrative state I think most perversely and perniciously we've seen over the last five years, the most disastrous for the Republic narratives coming out of the national security and intelligence apparatus, where the media, of course, has here also done a full 180. They used to be inherently not just skeptical of, but hostile towards the national security and intelligence apparatus. And of course, the media is supposed to take an adversarial view towards any powerful entity. But particularly, of course, when it comes to national security and intel or law enforcement, they are going to put out a narrative that they believe to be useful to them, just like any agency will put out a narrative useful to them. But it's not the job of the media to serve as stenographers. And of course, they have served as stenographers. There is no skepticism or scrutiny whatsoever, even though it, it, it arguably hurts these journalists on the merits, because you could distinguish one yourself by actually taking an adversarial or skeptical tone and being a real journalist. But I don't think they view it as the, that they're going to be rewarded for it. And of course, they have not paid a price for it. At Real Clear Investigations, where I serve as deputy editor, we've been hammering on the Russiagate story for years. And we put out a story you know, just pointing out, you know, the, the dozen or so articles or parts of articles where the Pulitzer Prize winning journalists at places like The Washington Post and The New York Times got things wrong and never corrected or retracted them. Mm -hmm. They pay no price for it. It's just on to the next story. And of course, we see a parallel in government of failing upwards in terms of people abusing their powers. When you look at the FISA court, when you look at uh, 
the rampant abuse within the DOJ and the FBI at the highest levels over the last five plus years. And they talk about protecting and preserving our institutions, our values, and being apolitical. It's actually the reverse in terms of the way they've acted. It's, and, and this is why I say our democracy is sort of a stand-in for our power, our agenda. Mm -hmm. It's a stand-in for we're going to protect our institutions, our power, our prerogative, our agenda, which we will argue is just and righteous and good, even if we abuse the laws, even if we abuse the public trust, because we're taking on what we perceive to be the broader enemy of the republic in Trump and his acolytes. So is there, an, is there a way to uh, course correct with our media? The fact that there are alternative outlets that have been built, that uh, an institution like a Substack can exist. I think people tune out and why is Joe Rogan so popular and why do they mm -hmm. have to try to crush Joe Rogan? Because tens of millions of people crave someone who will just have an interesting conversation and listen to people on different sides. That That is a direct personification of media failure, but they still dominate mouthpieces, which have a huge impact on American public life in terms of, for example, the Chinese coronavirus response. Would Americans have been uh, c comfortable with sort of complying with these diktats that were never questioned and allowing our most basic liberties to be usurped arbitrarily and capriciously for months on end, regardless of what the science actually said, were it not for the media and our public health institutions and politicians is power. And then when it comes to big tech, of course, being able to suppress narratives that conflict with its ultimate agenda, shared agenda with the politicians who, by the way, regulate it uh, and the media who they work with as well. Uh, it speaks to a, a nasty collusion against the Republic, a conspiracy against the Republic, I would argue. And this is reflected well, illustrated well, certainly in the Hunter Biden laptop story, but there are a whole slew of stories like it. And then when you add in, and I've written about this at length, the Biden administration's national strategy for countering domestic terrorism, it calls for working with big tech to counter misinformation and disinformation. When has it ever been the U.S. government's job to counter, as it describes it, misinformation and disinformation, i.e. things, for example, like around natural immunity or any of a million topics with respect to the coronavirus that it would have called dangerous misinformation and disinformation six months ago, but which now the CDC openly admits and puts out studies mm -hmm. on. It speaks to the fact that if the government is the arbiter of misinformation and disinformation, then I don't know, are we really a free republic anymore? Do we really have free and open discourse anymore? Certainly not, and this is most disturbing to me, when private actors in civil society of their own volition censor and suppress dissent. That's almost worse than a government doing it where you expect government to potentially try to infringe upon your rights and liberties. Now we have private sector actors doing it themselves. And that is a, is a terrible trend in American society. And we can credit our academic institutions as well as our media for that. Yeah, I, I think that's very true. Um, we don't have much time, but another element of this problem is the rise of the intersectional left and its permissive attitude towards anti-Semitism. As the author of a book about Ilhan Omar and the way the far left is taking over the Democratic Party, where would you say that project stands two years after uh, your book came out at the start of the pandemic? I guess I'd say I wish I was wrong, but but we see playing out in real time. The, the, the words, at least on Joe Biden's teleprompter, uh, in his executive orders and the like, are not consistent with the words you would have heard from Joe Biden in his right mind 20 years ago, 10 years mm -hmm. ago, maybe five years ago. And I think that says it all about the fact that he speaks like an Ibram X. Kendi or Nicole Hannah Jones. And one of the first things, and, and I wrote about this in the run up to his presidency, uh, I wrote about the fact that, first of all, he said that I share a common vision with Bernie Sanders. I don't think that was empty rhetoric now mm -hmm. because I think his party demands it. I think I don't think that Joe Biden really has strong convictions one way or the other personally based on my observation of his career, but I think he goes where his party is. The nomination, of course, of Judge uh, Katanji Brown-Jackson, I think perfect illustration of the fact that based upon you know, the soft on crime positions, who her allies are in terms of the most rabid, illiberal, progressive groups. And, and that's who Joe Biden believes should be one of the nine people on the highest court in the land, which really serves as, in effect, our legislative branch, at least on the most mm 
important questions, I think speaks volumes as well. I, I'd urge everyone check out the executive order. I believe it was a first day executive order put out by the administration on affirmatively advancing equity. And it calls for a whole of government uh, domination of the equity agenda throughout the federal bureaucracy, imposing it on the federal bureaucracy. And of course, this has manifested itself in a number of administration policies. Equity, of course, in, in the way that they say it, is antithetical to equality, is antithetical to judging each individual on their merits, protecting their rights, their liberties, meeting out justice equally, openly, honestly. That, that is out the window. They believe that justice is swinging the scales back. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, whether Joe Biden really believes this or not, I don't know, but that is the representative of the Democrat Party and look at what the agenda is. So I think it speaks for itself, the domination of this party. And I spoke, I spoke to it in my book about Ilhan Omar, where I talked about the Democrats' caves several times with Ilhan Omar, first putting her on the House Foreign Affairs Committee in the first place when this is someone who, as I argue and I chronicle in the book, would not pass a background check where she being vetted, vetted for a national security position. So it was up to her constituents to vet her and they, they failed to do so now a couple of times. Uh, this is someone who, of course, was supposed to be censured, uh, sanctioned effectively for her obviously anti-Semitic Jew hatred rhetoric. And the party caved and watered it down to essentially, we are going to speak out against any rhetoric that offends anyone uh, anywhere and not mm -hmm. name Ilhan Omar by name. And I think that cave perfectly told you the direction of their party because they viewed Ilhan Omar as the future of the party, or at least that's where the energy mm -hmm. was in the party. And I documented in the book the domination of the Progressive Caucus, which grew from Bernie Sanders and a few other members of Congress in the early 90s to now almost a majority, if not a majority of the House Democrat majority. So. It's there in terms of the policies. It's there in terms of the numbers. It, Ilhan Omar was the future of the party. I would say she is the party today in large part. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, and I think the everything we're seeing coming out of Washington uh, backs that up. Ben, uh, I want to thank you so much for your time and your insights. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, we also want to thank our audience. Whether you're listening to us on Spotify or any of the other podcast platforms, watching us on Facebook, uh, the JNS YouTube channel, or on JBS TV. Please like and or subscribe to Top Story and give us good reviews. Please let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself. And we'll see you again next week.